death by night. Out of unkind cold, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Tonight, transcribed, it's the Whistler's strange story, Bright Boy. <laughs> Inwardly, he was raging at her. Outside, Steve Carson looked cool as a piece of ice. Ten years as a private detective had given him that. The nonchalance outside, in spite of the burn-ups underneath. Yes, Steve was a top-notch detective. A bright boy. Smart enough to see, when Werner came along five years ago, that investigation fees were chicken fees. That with her beauty and his ability, there was real money on the other side of the line in blackmail. It had turned out to be a great thing, an unbeatable combination. And as he left the automatic elevator at the end of the corridor and walked down to her apartment, he thought what a shame it was that Werner could be so naive as to think she could change it with a simple phone call. Come in, Stevie. We've been expecting you. I could tell by your attitude on the telephone that you were unhappy, dear. You know Randy Summers, of course. Hello, Mr. Carson. Nice of you to drop in. Fred, I want to talk to you. Hello. Hello, Mr. Randy, darling, fix him a drink. Of course. Mm-hmm. Looks like you could use one. Are you going to get that guy out of here? No. I like having him around. You think I'm going to hold still for this? I think so. Well, that's a bad guess. If he stays, I go. Are we going through all that again? I'm not playing second horn, baby. If you want a new stooge, that's your business. If I'm going to quit, that's mine. I'm a private eye, not an errand boy. Get that through your head. Would you want to put it down in writing? In writing? (laughs) Dear fellow, surely you should know by now. I'm never to put anything in writing that concerns Werner. Stay out of this, Summers. Mm. I'm afraid our Mr. Carson isn't going to be the least bit cooperative tonight, is he, darling? Well, here's your drink, old man. Now, see here, Carson, I can take just so much of your bad hands and... Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Go on, him! See him! Now, look. This sort of thing isn't going to get you anywhere. I told you once before how things stand. Randy and I are running the show from now on, and we'll let you know when we need you. Is that clear? Okay, Bernard. This is your round. Meaning there might be others? Could be. What about our dear friend Charles W. Ralston? Suppose I were to tell him about the letters. Why, Stevie, you wouldn't stoop to that, now would you? What do you suppose Ralston would do if he found out he'd been paying for letters that were burned up three months ago? What? Is that true, then? What if it is? What happened? A little fire, Summers. An accident at Bernie's cabin. Yeah, she kept the letters there. Oh, the place up at Lake Tahoe. Wasn't that the one Walston broke for you as a contribution to the cause? <laughs> yes. Very well, nice of him, wasn't it, Steve? Oh, you love it, Randy. Way off in the mountains overlooking Lake Tahoe. Quiet, peaceful. Miles from anyone. <laughs> it was lucky you were there at the time, so it wasn't a total loss. You know, Steve, I think I'll have that old-fashioned ceiling lamp removed. Too dangerous. The same thing could happen again. Get back to the point, Verna. What about the letters? Well, since you brought it up with some nasty little insinuations that you might possibly tell Mr. Ralston. What makes you think I won't? Well, let's see. There's the Helen McCoy case. We know her death wasn't accidental, don't we, Steve? And then there was that swindle on the Falston woman. And the few other enterprises you wouldn't want the DA to know about. Uh Uh-huh. A skeleton in the private investigator's closet, huh? Oh, they could put you away for years and years, Stevie. And I know how you feel about short hair, Kurt. Now, darling, I don't think you're going to tell Mr. Ralston anything. You're going to go right on doing little favors for me without the usual percentage. You do it best for, uh, so we say, old time's sake. You need me, young. Very touching, darling. I have no idea Mr. Carson was so sentimental. What do you say, Steve? Okay, Vernon. Will you 
Shirley says we wouldn't look at it. Come on, let's have a drink on it. By all means. And this time, old man, shall we try not to spill it? It's also good scotch. Right? Yeah, I know. What? Please. Oh. Certainly. And, uh, Steve, there are a few little things I'd like to discuss with you. Randy's flying down to Los Angeles tonight. When he gets back, he'll join me at the cabin. The cabin? Mm, I'm going up alone tomorrow afternoon. Why don't you drop by? We'll talk things over. Well, I don't know, Runner. Mm, uh, you do you a lot of good. Mountain air, you know. Well, I could let you know in the morning. Good. You, uh, you do understand, don't you? That Randy and me. Everything's going to work out all right, isn't it? No trouble. Sure, Loretta. Sure. Yes, Steve. You're a bright boy. Smart enough to know there's only one way to handle Werner now. Leaving an apartment, you drive across town and finally pull up in front of another apartment building. And hurry up to the penthouse. I don't think you know me, Mr. Ralston. I, I'm afraid I don't. Uh, Steve Carson, private investigator. I came to see you about a, a Miss Brenda Sheldon. I'm sorry, I don't... I have a proposition, Mr. Ralston. Nasty, huh? Yes, yeah, please do. You, uh... You know all about the letters, of course. Mr. Ralston, you're a pretty influential businessman in this city. Also a man, shall we say, not without enemies. Now, let's suppose Miss Sheldon's letters were to fall into the hands of the wrong people. She assured me they won't. You don't know her. Suppose she were to sell those letters to a group of individuals for a sum much greater than you could afford to pay. She wouldn't. Oh, but she would. And is. Yeah, I've been able to find out that much and a little more. Shall I go on? Hmm. She's going up to a cabin tomorrow. Over the weekend, someone will contact her there to make the transaction. They ought to work fast if you want those letters. I see. Uh, uh, what's your proposition? I think I can break up that little meeting before it ever takes place. You could get the letters for me? Yes. But my fees run a little high for this sort of thing. And I... How much cost? $25,000. I can't possibly get it. You don't think it's worth it? Well, considering your position. No, oh, I, I, I couldn't, Carson. Twenty-five thousand. Think it over. And do make up your mind soon, Ralston. I'll call you sometime uh, tomorrow morning. You, you're quite certain she's planning to sell those letters? Oh, quite certain. Well, how do I know that this isn't another one of our tricks? And how do I know you're not in league with her? That's just a chance you have to take, Mr. Ralston. Good night. The next move is a big one, isn't it, Steve? There's the matter of the defective kerosene lamp in Werner's cabin at Lake Tahoe. The same lamp that caused the fire that burned Mr. Ralston's letter. A thing like that is liable to happen again, isn't it? Especially since you arrive at the cabin five hours later, equipped with five gallons of high-test gasoline, and proceed to change the possibility into a certainty. You can see Werner now arriving at the cabin, pulling the lamp down. There's the flick of a match, an explosion, and a fire to remove any trace of your visit. By 8 o'clock the following morning, you're back in town to call on Werner as you promised. I regret that you can't accompany us and to make sure her visit to the cabin is coming off on schedule. Well, if it isn't bright, boy. Oh, hey, right. Come in. I'm standing by. The lieutenant just left on an errand. Oh, yeah? What errand? You. Come on, Sergeant, what's the pitch? What are the police doing here? I was just going to ask you what you're doing here. Suppose you tell me first, huh? I was calling in Verna. Business. Okay. Go over there if you want it. Where? Under the blanket. 
He's dead. What? Slight case of homicide, a blunt instrument to coin a phrase. Surprise, see? Just a minute, the whistler will continue tonight's story. All of us are proud of our hometowns, and rightly so. In this brief moment before we continue with our program, we'd like to offer a salute to one of our hometowns in America, Indianapolis, Indiana. Capital of the state and a great transportation center, Indianapolis' extensive trade is based on the rich territory which surrounds it. Large coal fields, tremendous deposits of building stone, and one of the richest sections of corn and wheat in the world. But perhaps one of the best-known features of the city to the world at large is the Indianapolis Speedway. It was built in 1909 as a proving ground for automobiles, and each Memorial Day, the famous 500-mile race is held there. From the experience gained in this annual event have come many improvements in automobiles. Every time you use your rear vision mirror, every time you filled your tank with ethyl gasoline, every time you appreciated the comfort of your improved tires, you were given credit to something that was first used on that speedway. Indianapolis has its famous citizens, too. Benjamin Harrison, the 23rd president of the United States, called it his hometown. So did James Whitcomb Riley, the great Hoosier poet. And it was the birthplace of General Walter Beadle Smith, chief of staff of the American forces in Europe during World War II. Nearly half a million people live in Indianapolis today, and they're proud of the part their hometown has played in the building of America. And now, back to The Whistler. It's not too cold, isn't it, Steve? The news of Werner's murder. Alibi. Alibi. Alibi, flashing on and off in your brain like a neon sign. Everything you figured on, planned for, set up like a spring trap. Everything's gone. Burn is dead. Yes. You're the number one suspect. And you're driving on a lonely mountain road on an errand you can't explain at the moment she was killed. That'll sound great in court, won't it? But there's one thing you're sure of. Walston killed her. There's no question about it. The talk last night, the deadline you tossed up to him. Yes, it was Ralston, all right. It takes you just 15 minutes to get across town for a showdown with him. We'll get right to the point, Ralston. I'm here for two reasons. The first is that I'm as sure you knocked off Werner Sheldon as if I'd been there watching him. What? Oh, don't look surprised, Ralston. I had nothing to do with it. Don't give me that. I didn't get me found any with a jump in the entrance hall, and I could see it had been going over with a fine tooth comb. Maybe someone looking for those letters, eh? Someone who figured tomorrow it might be too late. Why are you so interested? My good friend, Sergeant O'Hara, seems to think I killed her. Unfortunately, it looks like my only defense is to prove you did it. Uh, letters, unless... Uh, unless what? Unless I come through with an alibi. I know you killed her, Ralston. I've been in the business long enough to know that all I've got to do to hang you is to flash those letters in the DA's office. You, you have them? I know where to get them. I've got to have them, Carson. I, I'll do anything. I'll, okay. First, there are a few things I'd like to know. Did anyone see you at Turner's apartment last night? I didn't go to her apartment last night. Okay. I'm going to dig up those letters. Come on, Ralston. Hey, wait, wait a minute. I did it. Yes. I killed it. I have to. I would have been ruined. No, I was better. No, you wouldn't have just hopped the cab and gone over there to knock her off, Ralston. No, no, you're smarter than that. You must have been me somewhere else at the time. Mm -hmm. First, I, I went down to the yacht harbor. I have a boat there. What time? 10.50. No one saw me first, but a short time after I went aboard the boat, the white watchman came by 
and called out to me from the dock. He had seen the light on the boat. What time? 10 30. He talked to him? Yes. So, as far as he was concerned, you were on the boat between 10 and 16 and when? Uh, he didn't see me again until I'd come back the second time. After I had uh, uh, after you left uh, off, Bernie, uh, yes. What time? 11 30. Yeah. I couldn't have done much better myself, Ralston. I was lucky. I, I spoke to the watchman at 11 30 when I was leaving for the night. Anyone else in the Yes, uh, several men a few yards ahead of me. I think they came from the club. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the watchman will recall our others when you spoke to him. Well, I suppose so. It's rather dark, but I, I, I think he must have noticed them. Oh, that's good enough for me. I'm sure the police will accept your word. Oh, what, what are you getting at? You're my alibi. I was with you on that boat all the time. Remember? Well, I that alibi was a lot to me, Ralston. Might even be willing to forget about the 25000 The watchman didn't see you being in the boat alone. He didn't see you leave when you left the his apartment, maybe when you came back. And when you finally checked with him just before going home, there were others around. That makes an alibi for the both of us. Go oh, back to others. You won't find them, Austin. You almost tore the tank to pieces and you couldn't find them. I could have told you they weren't there. You're going to go on believing me, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. Same way that she did. <laughs> you don't trust me, do you? Listen, Carson. Bring the letters here, and I'll give you the cash tonight. Well, let's wait until the investigation's over. Hmm? It's safer that way. For Stevie. Well, Steve, it's like sitting in on a poker game, isn't it? They're leaning back now, watching each of them play their trump cards, knowing all the time you have the topper up your sleeve. Randy Summers, the new boy, will be on his way back to Los Angeles, too. And you know that 30 seconds after he finishes his story of what happened between you and Verna on the evening of the murder, the DA will be on the phone, asking for the answer. There's nothing to do now but wait. Thursday. Friday. And then, Saturday morning, as you enter your office. Hello, bright boy. I've been waiting for you. What's on your mind, Larry? I'd just like to have a little talk with you, that's all. You and my Sheldon band are good friends, aren't you? Particularly good friends? A lot. The one that came from suddenly went sour. Ah, little pigeon flew in from L.A. Slipped that to you. You deny threatening her because she dropped you for the summer's guy? We had a slight disagreement, that's all. The first quarrel was a week ago at her apartment. The second was the next day in a downtown bar. And don't say you didn't, because Summers says so, and so does the bartender. The third one was on the night she was killed, just after she called you on the phone and told you it was all off. Now, what was the beef about? Well, you wouldn't be interested. Why didn't you tell me you were up to her apartment on the night of the murder? You didn't ask me. Summers was there, too, incidentally. He was still there when I left. He caught the 945 plane at the airport. We checked him. Now, you were there at 7.30. Right. The first time. What do you mean, the first time? You didn't go back around 10.30? What are you talking about, O'Hare? Seems to Sheldon then got a phone call at 9.15 just before Summers left. It was from you. Oh, uh, wait a minute. You're all wrong. You I made an appointment to see her at 10.30. That's a lie. Did you keep it, Carson? Someone's been giving the line. Summers was there when the call came in. She told him it was you. Said you were coming back. Summers wanted to stick around in case you got rough, but she told him she could handle you. So he took his plane. The guy's lying, O'Hara. I believe him, Carson. That's how I come to have this warrant. In the great debate of 1787 and 88 as to whether the Constitution should be voted for or against, the framers of our Constitution had a hard fight on their hands. But they had many allies, and one of them was James Sullivan, who wrote the following words to the Massachusetts Gazette in November of 1787. Let us view the characters who composed the late Constitutional Convention. Are they not men who, from their infancy, have been nurtured in the principles of liberty and taught to pay a sacred regard to the rights of human nature. 
Are they not honest, upright, and just men who fear God and hate evil? Brethren and citizens, listen to the voice of men who have thought only of you and your posterity's good. The Constitution was voted for, of course, because it was understood that the men who framed it did so not only for themselves, but for the future. We today are that future. And now back to The Whistler. Well, Steve, it's quite a poker hand, isn't it? O'Hara and Summers have played their cards. But you still have the copper up your sleeve. However, the phone call Vayner supposedly received from you is puzzling, isn't it? You try to figure it out as you sit in the ante room, waiting to see District Attorney Skelly. Summers must have been telling the truth. For some reason or other, Verna didn't want him to know who called and told him it was you. It was Ralston, of course, pleading for his letters again. And when she turned him down, he decided to kill her. Ralston, you knew you'd need that top car, didn't you, Steve? But you had no idea you'd need it this badly. <laughs> Hello, D.A. Doesn't look so good, does it? Yeah. Got it all figured out, huh? Just about. Oh, good. Now, if you'll stop figuring long enough to ask me where I was at the time of the murder, maybe we'll all have a great big laugh. Okay. Floor's yours. I was on a boat at Yacht Harbor, talking over some confidential business with a client of mine. Yeah? Who? Uh, he's a pretty important guy, Skelly. Big shot in the savings and loan business. Hmm. I suppose his name's confidential, too. No, no, not at all. Charles W. Ralston. Is that good enough? Ralston? If you don't believe me, get on the phone. Call him. You're, uh, serious about this? Sure. Go ahead, call him up. You better brace yourself. Ralston was killed in a cabin at Lake Tahoe last night. Seems a coal oil lamp exploded or something. A couple of rangers saw the flames. Something wrong, Carson? Now, a question. Do you know when the naval rank of Commodore was first recognized as such? During the Revolutionary War, the Navy used the rank of Commodore simply as an honorary title. Until 1861, all Navy captains who had at any time commanded a squadron were considered Commodore, though they were never actually given that commission. In 1862, however, Commodore was established as a fixed rank, and in July of that year, 18 were commissioned on the active list and 17 on the retired list. This is but one of many interesting facts which can be found in the history of your United States Navy. Featured in tonight's transcribed story were Bill Foreman as the whistler, Jack Moyle, Betty Lou Gerson, Jack Edward, Victor Rodman, Vic Perrin, and Olin Soule. The Whistler, directed by Gordon T. Hughes, with music by Wilbur Hatch, is produced by Joel Malone and transmitted overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This evening's story was by Adrian John Doe. The Whistler was entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarities of names or resemblances to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is George Walsh speaking, reminding you to listen again next week for another strange tale by The Whistler. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.